So I'd like to introduce our cast of characters. This is part two, Crypto Security Research 101. I would like to introduce our cast of characters. For purposes of discussion, everyone refers to um, Alice, characters like Alice and Bob, Eve and Mallory and Trent. So I'd like to walk through the cast of characters. I'll use it in this talk and in subsequent discussions, especially the one on hashes and encryptions, primitives and protocols. So, the primary relationship is Eve and Bob. Eve, excuse me, Alice and Bob. Alice and Bob know each other, they trust each other, they have overlapping agendas. Alice and Bob, we can think of them as fraternal twins. So they are our primary good guys. Good guy, good gal. Eve is an eavesdropper. You may think of Eve as being passive, but we're going to come back to that in a second. Mallory is an octave above or below Eve in that Mallory has malicious intent. So Eve is a somewhat passive eavesdropper. Mallory is a malicious attacker. In the real world, there may be one, more than one Alice or Bob. There may be more than one Eve with overlapping or unknown to each other agendas. There may be one or more Mallory's known or unknown to each other with overlapping or contradictory agendas. Though it won't come up today, I, for pur purposes of completeness, I'd like to talk about Trent, who is a trusted third party. You can think of a notary public as a trusted third party. I will notarize your your deed, I will notarize the title to your car, I don't care, I don't know any of you, if you've got cash in hand, I will sign and notarize it. On the flip side, you can all trust me because I am Trent, the trusted third party. So Ellis and Bob are Occupy Wall Street, Occupy Wichita. They're um, um, Earth First and um, any Jane Doe in Topeka, Kansas. Alice and Bob have a shared interest. They want to talk to each other and be able to exchange information. You may have a scenario where there is one Alice and many Bobs. For instance, I'm a publisher of information online. There is one centralized Alice, but everyone at this table is a potential subscriber. There are multiple Bobs. So let's not be rigid in our definition of Alice and Bob, other than that they are good guys with shared interests and a need to communicate. You may think, as I said earlier, that Eve the eavesdropper is passive and of limited um, threat because Eve is passive. Well, let's take a look at that from another point of view. If I can be in your basement and tap into your phone line, I know a whole hell of a lot. I don't need to know everything, but merely the traffic log, the, the record of what you did is of invaluable consequence to any, any attack. Um, the whole idea is, is traffic analysis. So the field of traffic analysis, I don't, I'm going to look at what you're doing, whether it's phone calls or text messages or web surfing, I'm going to look at the log file of your activity. I want to see the footprints in the sand of your digital life. That tells me a lot. So are you a frequent or an infrequent user? Are you Monday through Friday 9 to 5? Do you go one set of places Monday through Friday 9 to 5 and someplace else? <laughs> Evenings and weekends. A lot of information can be gleaned from mere traffic analysis. Eve can, can gain a lot of information. So, real world non-digital examples. Why do you think the police go to mafia funerals? To show up to see who shows up. You know, why do you rob banks? That's where the money is. So what's a value? The social connections between mobsters. Why the fuck do you think the police photograph mob funerals? They want to know who shows up. This is traffic analysis. If you suspect someone of being a bookie, when do you want to watch their phone activity? Super Bowl Sunday. The NBA draft. The seventh game of the World Series. 
So why do you think in the early days people parked across the street from Amazon's warehouse with a pair of binoculars and a clipboard? That too is traffic analysis. We all do it. You drive down the street in a new town, there's three restaurants, which one do you want to go to? The one with the line out the door. Who you talk with for how long and when is almost as important as what you say. If I'm emailing after hours to one particular person and my messages all have large attachments, does this mean anything? What if that person doesn't work for my company and isn't a business partner? Is that suspicious? What if that person is a journalist? Does that make me a whistleblower? So again, never underestimate the intelligence that Eve, the passive listener, can glean from watching your footprints in the digital sand. <coughs> So here's another little twist that straddles technology and culture. No matter how, now, it's agreed that the NSA, no such agency, has the largest collection of supercomputers in the world. For all we know, the People's Liberation Army has as many MIPS under their control through low-level distributed architecture as anyone. And my fear is there may be botnets out there who are doing far worse things than than uh, cracking bank passwords that they're cracking, you know what I'm saying. So don't think of Mallory as being an individual with either a supercomputer behind them or any one kid with uh, uh, three machines at home attacking a problem. There can be this distributed you know, distributed.net cracking um, uh, crypto algorithms publicly or a botnet doing things privately. So, no matter how many supercomputers a man has, they can't listen to every phone conversation or read every email. But traffic analysis tells me, if only 1% of the email traffic is encrypted, where should I apply my resources? Obviously, to those people who think they have something to hide, thinking it's so valuable they've taken the active step of encrypting it. So the only reason that this level of traffic analysis leads to a successful attack against the small, small minority of traffic that's encrypted is because only a small, small minority of, tra of email traffic or web traffic in general is encrypted. I would humbly submit that if we work hard to make encrypted traffic the norm, not the exception, that it throws off any brute force attack, no matter how large the pool of resources by any one or group of adversaries. Let me repeat that. If as a value and a cultural meme, we instill the practice by Jane and John Doe of moving encrypted traffic around if a significant portion of the web or phone or any kind of digital traffic is encrypted, targeting encrypted traffic for intense cryptanalysis goes out the window. The upside is, the better news is, it provides for better individual control of our digital lives and embodies the culture we're trying to build anyway. Okay, so to backtrack a second here, let's talk about our cast of characters. Alice and Bob are good friends. Alice and Bob trust each other. Eve is an eavesdropper. Mallory is malicious. So Alice and Bob are good guys, even Mallory bad guys. Trent is a trusted third party. You may think that Mallory is a threat and me, Eve is merely a nuisance. Don't underestimate what Eve can do. Let's talk about traffic analysis. Mob funeral to see who shows up. Suspect someone's a bookie, wiretap him the Super Bowl Sunday. Um, park across the street from Amazon's warehouse to count the trucks. You don't need to know what's in the trucks. If there's 15 trucks on Monday and 17 trucks on Tuesday and 22 trucks on Thursday, that's all that the adversary needs to know That you know, in terms of industrial espionage. So let's assume that purposes of every discussion here on out, everything I say for the rest of my life, within this group, we're going to assume that Eve and Mallory are in the phone closet. We know that's true. 
We are Ellis and Bob in a public elevator. It is our task to establish and maintain a secret in a crowded, compromised space. But because we know that Eve and Mallory are among us, their threat to us is somewhat diminished. If we were naive, we would walk around talking about secrets in public. So, when in the internet uh, work group on Facebook, I see people talking about logins with the username and the password in one post. Now that I've said it to this group, you will hereby be pimp slapped anytime you do something <laughs> stupid like that. Because you've been told. You now have the skill set to, e to evaluate a risk scenario and take the appropriate responses. You do something dumbass and stupid like that, I will pimp slap you. I will leave the outline of my hand across your cheek in public. Thank you. So, how would you get around that? You can do things like, it's called secret sharing. Perhaps I whisper half of the password in your ear and send the other half FedEx overnight. Perhaps... I give you part of it on Monday and part of it in another channel on Wednesday a week later. Or, I hope I have it with me. Two seconds. Ah, you'll have to take my word for it. So I have a good homeboy in a different city who I want to communicate with who travels overseas. No matter what password scheme we come up with, I took a dollar bill and tore it in half. He has half, I have half. I can now talk in a public space about establishing a password that includes in some permutation our shared secret, which is that, albeit low, I mean it's not the world's best salt, but that's okay. Jay and I can now establish a relatively secure secret on a public phone. I can go to the goddamn police department, make the phone call on the front desk. And because we share a secret, we can do mathematical things with a public chunk and a private chunk and, and maintain and establish a secret in a crowded elevator. We will come back to the exact mechanisms in the follow-up uh, hashes and encryptions, primitives and protocols, because it's really this as David Letterman calls it, a pyramid of comedy where you start with the foundation and build up to the punchline. So, so it goes back to the idea of doing your, uh, your audit of your assets, a, a, have, watching them self-organize into risk pods and value chains, and having different pools of access and passwords so that if Mallory does compromise the system, your exposure is limited. You know where those passwords or protocols were used. You can take the corrective steps to backfill and to replace those without having everything blown away. The goal of everything we should do is to encrypt locally and only move encrypted traffic around and never move stuff in plain text if at all possible. The only exposure you have is traffic analysis, which you can't get away from any way, shape, or form. So again, the tools that I'm writing assume that all of the heavy lifting is on the local device that you're sweeping up beside, behind yourself in terms of cleaning caches and cookies and not leaving residual crap if the man walks in and takes your laptop mid-sentence, freezes it, whatever. So there are two main factors to, that determine how good your encryption policies and habits are. Key selection and key management. The encryption algorithm itself is paradoxically often secondary to these two factors. For example, what good is AES-256 as an encryption algorithm if you leave your password on a post-it note on your computer screen? Who cares if you use Blowfish with its 448-bit key if you use secret or 123456 as your password? 
You can use the best encryption in the world, but it's worthless if you share keys over the phone. So there's this whole idea that the math and the algorithm and the code is one thing, but the context that includes human behavior is culture, either one person or the rest of the planet. And we need to pay as much attention to the culture that we bring to bear as much as the algorithm and the math. So, in terms of passwords, two words, long and strong. So I direct you to the Wikipedia article on password strength for all the math and supporting tables and footnotes. Long and strong. The best way, the dumb way to attack any system is to use a brute force attack. So you try every possible combination, 0000 to 9999, or AAAAA to ZZZZ, or everything in between. The odds are you're going to find the answer trying half of the possibilities. Um, but you're looking at, you know, a, a, a situation where the longer the key, the bigger the space that has to be searched. And once you have a constant for how many key combinations you can try per second, the key length is the real deal. Secondarily is the key strength. Um, I'm going to pass around what is the merged, it's two lists of the most common passwords used on the internet that are merged. The ones that appear twice appeared on both lists. Memorizing, the list won't be on the final exam. The reason I'm passing it around for you to look at is it will become immediately evident the habits that people bring to bear when users are allowed to choose their own keys. If the strength of any crypto system is in the key, not the lock, key selection and secondarily key management is of paramount importance. So when people use passwords like these, no matter what software they're typing it into, it's immaterial. Because the smarter way for an attacker to guess your password is not brute force trying every mathematical combination, but to try but to bring human behavior and habits to bear and to use a dictionary attack because there's a trade-off between ease of use and security. The passwords that are easiest to remember are the least secure because they fall into patterns, you can guess them, um, there aren't that many, um, and they provide less security than the system may inherently allow. So part of it is the length, hence the long, but the strong is not choosing dumbass shit. Don't choose the things on the list. Don't if I know you, if I if if you're my best friend from first grade, you should be shocked when you learn my passwords. Nothing about my past should give away what I've chosen to define myself digitally. Question. Uh, yes. The password method that I've used is a visual pattern on the keyboard. Oh, no, 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 no. Look at the list. The, the one that I couldn't figure out was Q, A, Z, okay, W, E, I actually, so I, I usually utilize passwords based on long phrases. Uh, when I was a child, I used to use serial numbers based on books, based on favorite CDs, so that like the Hacker soundtrack, for instance, the ISBN number for that. Uh, I used that literally for six years. Zero issues. Um, to be fair though, when, when you're talking about visual patterns, like for example, if you're taking your keyboard, they may often find that some people will go, you know, A S J D F. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. Like that. No, that's good. So, that's one one thing I like to. So bring up. I like spell my I spell my initials on the keyboard or, or no. different things like that. No, no, no. You want a, a random walk. You want something pattern enough to where you would be able to very simply remember that, like, yeah. I go in this sort of pattern, but you don't yeah. want it to be, uh, you know, all, like, half the numbers on the left, or oh, yeah, I 40, or... So can I, can I okay. continue, because we may, I may answer this question in a sec. Thank yes, you. Go ahead. So, my point was, with passing the list around, some systems are, they, they limit you by saying eight characters or less. Well, we know that long is better. So to say arbitrarily that eight characters is the longest you can go is bullshit. You're, using, you're doing your users a disservice. On the other hand, uh, 
um, there's that trade-off between ease of use and security because of memory, because you don't want people to write the stuff down. And most of us are not using password key rings. We're not using a flash drive with everything. That's a whole other kettle of fish. Not today, but let's talk about, you know, low tide lifts all boats. If we get everyone to increase the security of... If we can get everyone to use a password and habits that are 10% more secure than what they use now, all of us benefit. So... Eventually, we should all aim for that, you know, five nines, you know, everything's perfect, zero defect, whatever. But there are so many dumbass passwords out there that as a tech sangha, our mission, our precept should be to instill these values among our sisters and brothers such that these this list changes over time to where we don't see dumb stuff. So, let's talk about passwords and, and in a different way sense. Let's take a step back. What you really want is something that is random and hard to guess that resists a dictionary attack and forces that that dilutes the value of a dictionary attack so that it mathematically begins to look like brute force. Does that make sense? I want to ameliorate the benefits of a dictionary attack. So the more I use words and and the first line of my favorite Led Zeppelin song or whatever the hell it is, the easier it is for someone to second guess you with the dictionary attack. There are ways around that. So you use a relatively strong password that you can remember as a humanoid, as wetware, to feed a password engine. You hash your password. You salt it and hash it. You do a bunch of games so that you, so that Jay and I use the serial number off that dollar bill to make our easy to remember password that much longer. So people, so you know Moore's law. Every 18 months, half the price doubles, whatever. So here's the deal. When I looked at Schneier's book just this morning, and over the past couple of weeks, applied cryptography uh, volume two. Um, here's the deal. He projects and says the projections are bullshit. MIPS and dollars and attackers' resources. The book is so old that you have to look at Wikipedia and more recent things and do some creative extrapolation to figure out what an attacker like Mossad or the Brits or the Russians or NSA or whoever, what they're gonna what they're gonna bring to bear on the on the on us. On us. Because we are in their crosshairs. So what you do is you have so for brute forces, you make a system so that you can have three attempts and it locks you out for 30 minutes. Any automated script kitty kind of thing can't get through that. You have a two-part thing. There's a token and a password, a no and a hold. I have to know the password and hold the token. You have a caption. Are they bullshit? Yeah, but it's going to slow someone down. It's going to make a compound problem for someone who's trying to attack you. Um, in day trading, in financial stuff, the window that you need for absolute security is measured in seconds. Launch code, 20 minutes for a missile to get across the globe. Corporate secrets and personal information, health records, fuck, I might want to lock my shit up until after I'm dead times plus 10 years. That's at least 75 years, you know what I'm saying? Yeah! So, um, you have to think about the life of your keyword when factoring in the risk, the exposure, and the measures you're going to take. You know, this whole thing about uh, um, some president fuck up and they lock things away the National Archive until 25 years after they're dead or some shit, or the, you know, whatever JFK assassination conspiracy you want. They build in these things, and what are they doing? They're, you know, this is locked up with encryption. I'm going to factor in what someone can do in the next 24 years, 11 months, 51 weeks, 6 days to get at this, to, de to beat me by a day. My point is, you need to think about a number of factors if we all agree that the security is in the key, not the lock. So... I'm working on some stuff, and it'll be the second part with the primitives and protocol, uh, where you can do what's called key stretching. 
where you take a relatively good key that a human can remember and stretch it out, either hashing it and getting a truly random number or some other longer construct that resists a dictionary attack. Now here's what's going on with Moore's Law. So in the old days in Bruce's book, he could say, no one can do this because it costs too much. Well, shit, man. We all know that bandwidth is free, that disk space, it might as well be free, and processing power is dropping faster than any motherfucker could ever have had a wet dream nightmare about ten years ago. I mean, it, 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 it's incredible. Um, so, what you really need to do is to stretch the key by hashing it, or salting it, or using nonces to make the key that's used for the encryption cryptographically secure, even though the key that a human used to trigger that sequence was not secure in and of itself. Now, when you say salting it... So, so Jay and I now share the serial number of a dollar bill that only he and I know about because I tore it in half and we both got half. So we talk on the phone in the elevator and establish a semi-secret and we then prepend or postpend, we add, we concatenate that dollar bill serial number to the thing we whispered in the elevator. Or, so, tooting my own horn, I spent months in this very establishment writing a framework called Phone Frame. And phone frame has many implementations. It's a scheming and naming thing, HTML5, CSS3. But I've done a web front end that generates a stack much like Twitter, LIFO, most current on top, oldest on the bottom. Title, message, link, optional, anchor text, optional. Alerts and updates. You're in the streets, you need to tweet or to send stuff. But the difference between this and Twitter is every time you post an entry, it creates at a minimum, a hash value of the title, the message, which are required, and the link and anchor if you use them. That's a little use. What's the real use is, you can enter a secret. So I'm Alice, publishing to many bobs. You want to make sure that it's me saying this stuff about what's happening at the port on 1212. Because we've all agreed that our secret key is IPA at Beverage Place Bub is really tasty, exclamation point, exclamation point, I then use that phrase, the title, the message together to do a hash, and I write that out to the file. So when Forrest reads this, he computes that hash value and goes, that must be Jerry, because the only person who could have written this hidden value in this public online host is someone who knows the same secret that I do. Everyone else, it's just gibberish, and not, not even displayed. My point being, you can build in protocols and structures that implement the services and values you want into much of what we do online. So, if... Uh, let me go back here. Oh, so here are the... I, again, I, I point you to the Wiki, Wikipedia thing on password strength, but just to give you round numbers. 8-bit key, there's 2 to the 8th possible keys. There's 256 possible keys. A 56-bit key like DES, which is used on the back of your pin, the, the ATM debit card, uses 56-bit DES. Um, 2 to the 56th um, possible keys it would take 2,285 years if you could try a million keys a second. When you move to 64-bit, which is 2 to the 64th number of possible keys, you go from 200 and, or 2,285 years to 585,000 years. That's a lot. Makes a difference. Makes a difference. 400. So when you start looking at Blowfish at 448, uh, eight, let alone AES at 256, long and strong. I mean, that's just... 100,000 years. Oh, yeah. It, it gets beyond the age of the universe. Um, so for instance, if you are storing, if you're building a system that has servers and you need to store data, 
you will be a target of attack because what you're storing is of value. I would humbly suggest that you don't store everything literally, but in some cases, like a user login, you would store the hash value of that. If it's compromised, the idea of a hash is it's a mathematical function that's easy to compute one way and virtually impossible to comp compute in reverse. And that for two unique inputs, you'll get two unique outputs, and it's very hard to incur a collision where two different inputs generate the same output. So, if my login is Jerry and my password is, this is my secret, and my, my hash may be one, two, three, four, five, it's gonna be hard for anyone else to come up with a duplicate password and login that generates the same hash value. So, you can securely and confidently store the hash value on your server, knowing that if someone compromises that, they can't reverse the hash and recover my login credentials. So, storing hash values is, in general, infinitely more secure than storing the original data. The only way that Alice and Bob, client and server, can arrive at the same hash value is by sharing the same secret. So you can be in an elevator, there can be Mallory's beating the shit, they can be in your machine, they can have your database. They still can't recover your login or your login because the hash value has virtually zero leakage about the nature of the original data used to create it. And don't use MD5. Oh, SHA-256, SHA-512. <laughs> Next time, we'll go into that. Um, so, in terms of how, what are the odds of your brute force attack succeeding? Well, the answer is, how fast can you test each key, and how many keys do you need to test? So if I choose an algorithm that's slow, it foils Mallory's attempts by take, forcing Al Mallory to take longer to compute that function. And the longer my key length, the more keys Mallory has, and the longer it will take him or her to recover my secret. So uh, I will leave you with this. Uh, there's this whole issue of uh, key stretching, where you hash a key. Um, the reason you do that is, oh, Moore's Law, and I'll wrap this up here. When I look back at Schneier's book, it was written so long ago, internet transmission speeds, CPU power, and storage were factors to be considered. Now, and that's faster than grease snot, storage is in the cloud and too cheap to meter, and now people use their graphic processing unit instead of their CPU because they're better tuned to cryptanalysis, not even talking about field programmable gate arrays. I mean, you can use a, a gaming machine as a, as a code breaker better than a CPU. So, um, the value we need to instill in ourselves as code writers and as examples for our sisters and brothers is the idea of long and strong. It has to be long because there are more resources Mallory can bring to bear on cracking your key. No one even thought about GPUs as code cracking devices. They're talking about custom machines. You can buy one off the internet. It, it, you can use Xbox. You can use an Xbox. Mm -hmm. An array of, I mean, it's a, a cluster of them. Yeah. Exactly. So, so in terms of, uh, so what people do is they store the hashes of every possible 8-bit key. Because it's faster to do a lookup in a database of pre-computed hash values than it is to compute the hash values from scratch. That's a different kind of attack and incredibly successful. So, what, so it really reinforces the notion that we need to use long keys and to salt those with random stuff to do salts and nonces so that the pre to, to diminish the efficiency and the benefit of pre-computed tables because you can compute them quickly and you can store them quickly and you can move the data around near instantaneously making these cryptanalytic attacks cheaper than when Bruce wrote his book. So, how'd I do boss lady? Thank you.